Good evening. I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University. I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual presentation of the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize. This is one of my very favorite annual events in which we honor remarkable women from around the world who are forging new paths in biomedical research. Since 2004, there have been 22 recipients of the Green Guard Prize, all of whom are brilliant and innovative scientists who have helped to shape biomedical research over the past half century. Their achievements span a broad array of fields, including molecular biology, cancer research, immunology, biochemistry, genetics, biophysics, and neuroscience. Tonight, we recognize another groundbreaking scientist, Dr. Pamela Bjorkman. Her use of crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, and biochemistry has helped to explain how our immune system distinguishes self from non-self, thereby allowing the recognition of pathogens such as viruses that have infected cells in the body. Insights from her work are fundamental to understanding not only how the body fights infectious diseases like HIV and COVID-19, but also for diseases caused by defective regulation of the immune system, such as autoimmunity and complexities of modern medicine like rejection of transplanted organs. I'm pleased to acknowledge my colleagues on the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize Selection Committee who are joining us virtually this evening to celebrate Dr. Bjorkman. We're fortunate to have such a distinguished group of scientific leaders taking part in the selection process including four Nobel laureates. The complete committee list can be found on our prize website. The Perlmeister Greengard Prize was co-founded by the late Dr. Paul Greengard and his wife, the renowned sculptor Ursula von Reidingsvard. Paul was a giant in the field of neuroscience. He received the, two th the year 2000 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for his crucial discoveries about the mechanisms of signal transduction in the brain that regulate the activity of neurons. His work has shed light on the causes of neurological and psychiatric illnesses, including Parkinson's disease, depression, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's disease. He and Ursula chose to donate his monetary share of the Nobel Prize to establish tonight's award. Let's now learn more about the prize. The Perlmeister Green Guard Prize is a real gem uh, here at Rockefeller, and I think it's a consequence of a visionary idea and the very high standards uh, with which uh, the recipients have been uh, selected. And now Professor Paul Green. The genesis of this prize goes back to uh, the year 2000 when I won the uh, Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology and Medicine. The prize is called the Pro Meister Green Guard Prize uh, because it was named in honor of my mother who died giving birth to me and it seemed that it would be a nice thing since I wanted to do something about discrimination against women to name it in her memory. One hope from this prize is that women who are fascinated by science, who are thinking about careers in science, will see these incredible women who have been leaders in science, have been successful in science, and are recognized in science, and see these women and say, I want to be like her and I bet I can. So I think the reason that I was so interested in chemistry is that it made sense to me and it had rules. I decided sort of out of the clear blue sky that I wanted to solve a structure of something called human histocompatibility antigen or HLA. And it seemed to me basically impossible that these human leukocyte antigens or HLAs could bind to every possible viral protein from every virus. It didn't make any sense to me from a structural point of view and I thought if we could solve the three-dimensional structure and actually look at this molecule, we could figure it out. I think in the end, the more basic knowledge we have, the better we'll be able to make vaccines and make therapeutics. I'm very touched by the fact that the prize is named after Dr. Greengard's mother, who died when she was giving birth to him. And I think this is a really wonderful way to honor his mother 
And also from what I've read, he wanted to clear up a discrepancy where men are often more noticed for scientific discoveries than women are. And so this is a way to bring women more into the spotlight. And as I looked through the list of other women who've received this prize, and these women are my heroines already. And so to be in their company is very nice for me. Thank you so much to Ursula von Reidingsvard Grieve and her team for producing such a compelling video and for sharing her parents' dedication to the Green Guard Prize. A beautiful new permanent exhibit showcasing the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize has been installed on campus in the Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller Hall. Each translucent plaque of the installation, mounted in the floor-to-ceiling windows in the Abbey Reception Hall, displays the name and likeness of a recipient, a summary of her landmark discoveries, and the name of the distinguished presenter of that year's prize. We'll continue to add to this exhibit as new recipients are honored. It will be a main feature at all of the university's lectures, symposia, and other events that are held in this space. For those of you who come to campus, I hope you will take the opportunity to stop by the Abbey to see this beautiful exhibit composed from dichroic glass, which produces a dazzling array of colors from each panel, depending on the angle of transmitted light. It is really very striking and beautiful. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, our special guest presenter this evening. Throughout Dr. Campbell's illustrious career, she has established herself as a stalwart supporter of women and people of color in the arts and sciences. Dr. Campbell currently serves as the 10th president of Spelman College, the oldest private liberal arts institution for black women in the country. Located in Atlanta, Spelman College is also a national leader in the education of black women in the sciences, many of whom go on to receive doctorates in science, engineering, and medicine. Spelman is also consistently ranked number one on the U.S. News and World Report's list of historically black colleges and universities. Spelman College and Rockefeller University share a common early philanthropic supporter, John D. Rockefeller. Spelman College was founded in 1881 by two teachers and abolitionists from New England, Sophia Packard and Harriet Giles. At the time, it was named the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary. Rockefeller and his wife, Laura Spellman Rockefeller, who was an educator, were introduced to the seminary by Packard. The couple supported its mission and growth in those early days, including the construction of the oldest building on its campus, Rockefeller Hall. In 1884, the school was renamed Spellman Seminary in honor of Laura and her parents, who were also noted abolitionists. The name changed to Spelman College in 1924. Dr. Campbell received a Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature from Swarthmore College and a Master's in Art History and a PhD in Humanities from Syracuse University. After receiving her PhD, Dr. Campbell's professional career began not in academia, but in the arts. She served as director of the Studio Museum in Harlem for more than a decade. Her role there began at a time when New York City was on the verge of bankruptcy and Harlem was in steep decline. Under Dr. Campbell's astute leadership, the museum was transformed into the country's first accredited Black Fine Arts Museum, and she helped launch and nurture the artistic careers of many Black artists. It is now a vibrant artistic center in Harlem and a hub for creative thinkers, both locally and internationally. In 1987, Dr. Campbell was named New York City's Cultural Affairs Commissioner, a role in which she became known as an indefatigable advocate for large and small arts organizations throughout all five boroughs. Four years later, she was appointed Dean of New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, a position she held for more than two decades. Her tenure at Tisch was notable for producing artistic trailblazers in theater, film, and interactive media. As dean, Dr. Campbell markedly diversified both the student body and the faculty, and she incubated several new arts and technology divisions within the school and the university. 
1990, the Smithsonian Institution named Dr. Campbell as chairwoman of a 22-member advisory board to study ways to exhibit the heritage of black Americans on the National Mall. This study laid the groundwork for the creation of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. In 2009, Dr. Campbell was appointed by President Barack Obama to be vice chair of the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. As vice chair, Dr. Campbell took an active role in reaffirming the arts as one of the essential components of effective public school education. Dr. Campbell became president of Spelman in 2015, and in this role, she has dedicated herself to ensuring that every Spelman student with, graduates with a competitive edge. A cornerstone of these efforts has been Dr. Campbell's Imagine, Invent, Ascend initiative, a bold strategic vision that builds on the college's remarkable legacy and includes a deep focus on STEM innovation and technology. Dr. Campbell recently announced that she will retire from Spelman at the end of this academic year and will leave the college stronger than ever and prepared for the future. She is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and holds honorary degrees from a number of colleges. In 2018, she published the book, An American Odyssey, The Life and Work of Romir Bearden, for which she received the Hooks National Book Award. Just last year, Dr. Campbell was featured in the HBO documentary, Black Art in the Absence of Light, that explores the rich and largely neglected history of black artists in the United States. It is a powerful film, and I urge you to see it. We are deeply honored to have Dr. Campbell here with us today. Let's hear from her now. Thank you, Dr. Lifton. I am honored to be part of the celebration of Dr. Pamela Bjorkman, the David Baltimore Professor of Biology and Bioengineering at California Institute of Technology and the 2021 recipient of Rockefeller University's Pearl Meister Greengard Prize for Outstanding Women in Biomedical Research. Congratulations, Dr. Bjorkman. You join a lineage of 22 outstanding women scientists who before you have received this award. Your addition makes the lineage of awardees that much more distinguished. If Dr. Paul Greengard were still with us, I would say to him, and I say to his spouse, the renowned sculptor, Ms. Ursula von Reinigsvard, that as an art historian who's been married to a physicist for 53 years, I am so inspired by your generosity and purposefulness as a scientist-artist couple. I'm inspired not only by your willingness to use all of the proceeds of Dr. Greengard's 2000 Nobel Prize to see the establishment of this award at Rockefeller University in 2004, but also by your willingness and honesty to call out a bias on the part of the scientific enterprise. The award is meant to be a means of remedying the negative impact of this bias within the field. As we all know, the genesis of the award in part was to acknowledge the discrimination women face in science and the fact that their contributions are often not adequately acknowledged. Based on the evidence of the past 17 years, we can all agree that the gift has accomplished exactly what it set out to accomplish, and that is to shine a bright light on the groundbreaking contributions of women in science. Three women who have received the Pearl Meister Green Guard Award have gone on to receive the Nobel Prize for their work. I'm inspired, too, to learn that the gift honors the memory of Dr. Greengard's mother, Pearl Meister Greengard, who by all accounts was a smart, talented young woman who died giving birth to Dr. Greengard. I was especially moved by Dr. Greengard's words in a September 26, 2006 New York Times interview. In the interview, Dr. Greengard recalls that as he discovered more and more about his mother, he learned that she was Jewish, that a photograph that he had thought was of her was someone else, and there was not one shred of physical evidence of her existence. Memories of her had been buried. 
Part of the motivation for establishing the award was to disinter those memories, to make her visible to the world, to make her story seen and known to the world. And that too has been accomplished with the telling of her story every year. This resonated with me. Spelman College is in the business of making visible the talents of women whose talents otherwise might remain invisible to the world. Dr. Greengard, Vincent Astor Professor and Director of the Fisher Center for Alzheimer's Disease Research at Rockefeller University, certainly did not suffer from invisibility in his career. A member of the Rockefeller University faculty since 1983, Dr. Greengard became well known for his investigation into the signaling method of neuronal communication. That amounted to what President Lifton has described as a paradigmatic shift in the understanding of the biochemistry of nerve cells. In 2000, Dr. Greengard shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for work that laid the groundwork for therapies that address any number of chronic and debilitating diseases of the brain, including Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Nor does the work of his wife, Ursula von Reitingsvard, suffer from invisibility. Her larger-than-life sculptures, with their majestic presence, create for the viewer a kind of Grand Canyon experience of space and time. What I like about this prize is the recognition that talent does not necessarily grow and manifest itself on its own. More often than not, talent requires time, attention, cultivation, in order to push itself forward to become visible to the world. Dr. Greengard and Ms. von Reitingsvard understood that having one of the world's leading research institutions confer an award established by a Nobel laureate in an amount that was significant and in the context of a meaningful ceremony was the kind of care and attention that could enable women scientists to reap the benefits of the hard work and accomplishments they have sown during their careers. That resonated with me as well. At Spelman, our reason for being is to cultivate in the young women we educate at Spelman College, not only the expertise but the will to succeed, the confidence in the validity of their voice and in the value of what they bring to the table. And succeed they do. No other baccalaureate college in the country produces more black women who earn PhDs in STEM fields than Spelman College. This year, we have a record 800 first year students Half of those students have declared either biology or health science careers as their major. We know that among young black women, the desire to excel in the biological and medical sciences is there. Our job is to give them the tools to succeed, not only at Spelman, but beyond the Spelman gates. Here today, representing Spelman College as its 10th president, I am especially honored to present this particular award to this particular awardee, Dr. Pamela Bjorkman. Dr. Pamela Bjorkman's laboratory is described on the Caltech website as, quote, interested in immune recognition of viral pathogens. We are investigating the immune responses against HIV-1 and other viruses, most recently SARS-CoV-2 in order to develop improved therapeutics and or vaccines, end quote. And I could not help but notice that on the website, there's a list of announcements, many of them heralding the accomplishments of the women in Dr. Bjorkman's lab. Dr. Bjorkman's work could not be more timely. As we experience a surge of infections, hospitalizations and deaths from the Delta variant of the COVID-19 virus and knowing that as the virus continues to mutate, other variants are sure to emerge. Dr. Bjorkman's lab has been investigating a multi-strain vaccine that could prove effective against a variety of variants. As she and others counsel, we are racing against time. It is not a matter of if, and as she pointed out in a recent Atlantic Magazine article, 
but when there will be another coronavirus. Her lab and the work of the talented men and women in it are a bulwark against the next viral invasion. They could not be doing the work they are doing without that attention to the care and cultivation of their talent. And it is in that work, Dr. Bjorkman, that you, this prize, and Rockefeller University are an inspiration to Spelman College. Dr. Lifton, in your introduction, you reminded us that Spelman College and Rockefeller University share the same seminal donor, John D. Rockefeller. Let me digress for a moment to tell the Spelman College origin story because I think it has some lessons for today and for all of us attending this ceremony. According to one of Rockefeller's biographers, Ronald Chernow, our school was Mr. Rockefeller's first major philanthropy. His interest in the school came about in the decades after the Civil War. After the war, the South was deeply wounded and fractured. Moreover, millions of emancipated slaves had few educational pathways available to them. While some options for black men were taking shape, there were very few educational opportunities for black women. Two white missionaries, Sophia B. Packard and Harriet E. Giles, teachers from Salem, Massachusetts, traveled to Atlanta, Georgia explicitly to remedy the lack of education for black women and girls by starting the Atlanta Baptist Female Seminary. On day one, April 11th, 1881, 10 black women and one black girl showed up to Packard and Giles' new school. Their classroom was a soot-filled basement in Friendship Baptist Church, one of the oldest black churches in Atlanta. Those first students came to learn to read and write. By learning to read and write activities forbidden to slaves, they could read the Bible to their families and write letters for members of their communities. Now to keep this school running, the two Baptist missionaries, Packard and Giles, had to fundraise. And one Sunday morning, friends arranged for them to attend a church service in Cleveland, Ohio, knowing that among the attendees would be John D. Rockefeller and his wife, Laura Spellman Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller was already on his way to becoming the richest man in America. His wife, Laura Spellman Rockefeller, was not only from a family of staunch abolitionists who had been members of the Underground Railroad, she had also studied at one of the schools up north where Packard and Giles taught. As John and Laura sat in the Cleveland church and listened to Sophia B. Packard talk about providing the best education possible, the Rockefellers were inspired by the idea of this school for emancipated black women. But before he made a gift, Mr. Rockefeller insisted on knowing from Packard and Giles, will it stick? Will this school stick? He claimed that he only gave money to something that was going to be around for a while, something that would stick. 140 years later, Mr. Rockefeller would be pleased to know that this school he supported did stick. He and his wife went on to make many gifts and the school was named in the late 19th century Spelman Seminary after Laura Spelman's family and in 1924, Spelman College. Spelman College has come a long way from teaching reading and writing in a sooty basement. Our academic partnerships with research centers like the Broad Institute of MIT Harvard, a joint neuroscience graduate program with Morehouse School of Medicine, and a soon to be established partnership with Johns Hopkins University, the school from which Dr. Greengard received a PhD, are just a few of the relationships that enable our women to prepare for highly competitive graduate and professional studies in STEM fields. These partnerships are a community of purpose whose goal is to overcome the persistent barriers that black women who attend Spelman face and have faced for 140 years in a country that still bears the wounds of the war that gave birth to Spelman 
in the first place. Because of John D. Rockefeller's continuing philanthropy, Rockefeller University was founded 20 years after Spelman in 1901 in order to advance the study of biomedical research, the country's first such institution. As our country grew into an industrial and financial behemoth, John D. Rockefeller correctly recognized that basic science, buttressed by first-rate educational institutions and research centers, were in essential in order for the country to advance. In the case of Rockefeller University, the investment would lead over time to your becoming, as you describe yourselves, the gold standard of bioscience. Because of the generosity of our mutual donor, and in part with the continuing support of the family's generosity to both of our institutions, we each in our own way have played a critical role in shaping the future of science in this country. Yet, we all know that if we have discovered how to make progress towards gender equity, we have not been nearly as successful with racial equity. As we are learning from the most recent census, the population of black and brown young people is climbing rapidly and now constitutes a majority of the school age population. We know that for the most part, this population is not entering and completing high quality undergraduate programs, completing graduate degrees, competing for postdocs, and landing in research labs at rates commiserate with their growing presence in the population. We spend a great deal of time at Spelman understanding where the barriers might arise and finding ways to prepare our women to clear the hurdles they will inevitably face. We ask ourselves, how well are they prepared? And what can we do to make them even more prepared? What do our women need to succeed do they need study groups, community cohorts, mentors, coaches? Are we preparing them to present papers at conferences, win placements in important research labs, land the kind of internship that will inform their graduate work? Do we groom them to become co-authors of research papers and develop their presentation skills? Are they prepped? to compete in national and international competitions that require them to stretch beyond their comfort zone. Who is in the classroom with them? Who wants to see them succeed? These are the questions we, the administrators, faculty, students, and staff at Spelman ask ourselves all the time. We are unrelenting. Why, you might ask. I mentioned that my husband is a physicist, and this year the American Physical Society invited him to write a reflections piece on his career as a black physicist for the back page of the APS newsletter. Having earned his PhD in theoretical particle physics in 1977 from Syracuse University, my husband, Dr. George Campbell Jr., President Emeritus of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art, went on to work at AT&T Bell Laboratories, at the time, another leading research institute. In the article, he made note of the fact that in 1977, when he earned his doctorate, there were seven black physicists awarded PhDs in physics out of 1,000 physics PhDs awarded that year. He goes on to note that 40 years later, in 2017, there were 14 black physicists awarded PhDs in physics out of 2,000 physics PhDs awarded that year, exactly the same proportion as 40 years earlier. As a group of educators who care about equity in the practice of science, we all have to ask what steps do we all need to take to make meaningful breakthroughs in bias and discrimination that prevail around race. I raise this issue tonight because I know that I am speaking to an audience that cares about the elimination of all kinds of inequities in order to open the practice of science to the most diverse set of ideas and possibilities available. Make no mistake, I am well aware that there's a great deal of work to be done in our institutions and long before students reach our institutions. 
Many of our urban school systems are broken and cheat some of our most promising students out of a good K through 12 education. We know that very often high need, high performing students don't even apply to college, let alone to elite schools. And many times when they do attend four year colleges, they find the obstacles too numerous and too daunting to overcome. We can see it in the graduation rates for black and Latinx students that are among the lowest in the country. These obstacles are formidable, but not insurmountable. Take the issue of K through 12 education. When a group of Atlanta principals from our local schools asked us to assist with the literacy problem in their schools, Spellman responded with an intervention implemented by our students. The college, coached by one of our family literacy experts, deployed a group of over 100 highly trained Spelman students to teach literacy to fifth, sixth, and seventh graders at a group of local schools. Over a period of two years, the results of this after-school tutorial program were impressive. Reading assessments improved by as much as 20%. A similar effort called Math Corps, designed at Wayne State and supervised by a Spelman faculty who was a participant in the Wayne State program, will be deployed this semester by sending our best mathematics students to provide immersive mathematic tutorials to high school students every Saturday. We believe that as an educational institution, we have to reach back and extend a hand even as we are encouraging our own students to look forward into their future. I've looked at the website of Rockefeller University Summer Science Research Program designed for 16 year olds. And I see in that program the same impulse to build real skills that will begin to build a bridge between high school and college. There is much work to be done but not to do this work is to leave untold numbers of promising young people invisible, untended, their talents buried needlessly. Once again, congratulations, Dr. Bjorkman. The imagination and vision of Dr. Greengard and his wife, Ursula von Reisenwald, ensured that the spirit of Pearl Meister Greengard lives and women in science are the better for it. Their model inspires us to reach for even more. Thank you very much, Dr. Campbell, for your moving and powerful words. I would now like to introduce Dr. Pamela Bjorkman, our honoree this evening. Dr. Bjorkman is the David Baltimore Professor of Biology and Bioengineering at the California Institute of Technology, where for many years she was also an HHMI investigator. Throughout her career, Dr. Bjorkman has exploited structural biology to understand how our bodies fight viral invaders. By unveiling the details through which elements of the immune system interact with one another and their targets, she has exposed previously opaque biological activities that underlie health and disease. Dr. Bjorkman grew up in Park Rose, Oregon. There, her perception was that girls were expected to do well in school, meet a nice man at college, get married, and have children. By the time she was in high school, she decided to pursue a career because she did not want the life that she witnessed among the moms around her. She told no one. While she loved to understand how things worked, she had come to dislike science because it was presented as a set of facts to memorize. Fortunately, her eighth grade teacher kindled a spark when he encouraged the students to dream up questions and devise experiments that would address them. At the University of Oregon, she majored in chemistry and soon realized that she wanted to use science to improve human health. Dr. Bjorkman proceeded to Harvard for her PhD, where she heard a talk by the X-ray crystallographer Don Wiley. She grasped that a molecule's structure could not only provide insights into its function, but could also inform drug or vaccine design. The potential of harnessing structural biology to advance medicine captivated her. She joined Dr. Wiley's lab and proposed a wildly ambitious thesis project. 
At the time, immunologists knew that activation of cytotoxic T cells by virus-infected cells requires detection of a foreign antigen as well as a host protein from the class one major histocompatibility group, the MHC, that enables discrimination of cells that are self versus non-self. The mechanism for this dual recognition was not understood. This problem was central to understanding the function of the immune system. Dr. Bjorkman decided to solve this puzzle by determining the structure of the class one histocompatibility antigen. This project faced numerous daunting challenges, including being able to get crystals of the protein in complex with its partner called beta-2 microglobulin. Dr. Bjorkman persevered, and after seven years of painstaking work, her work resulted in a beautiful solution. The result revealed a structure that was amazing. The type 1 MHC proteins are highly variable, and the structure that showed the most variable portions localized to a groove in the extracellular surface of the protein. Most amazingly, the crystallized protein actually had an antigen of unknown origin bound in the groove. This structure immediately suggested that type 1 MHC is used to bind protein fragments from intracellular pathogens and present them on their cell surface to, to T cells, activating the subset that can specifically recognize both the class 1 MHC and the bound foreign antigen. These findings have had critical implications for understanding the mechanism of immuno immunological tolerance and autoimmune diseases. Dr. Bjorkman then went to work with Mark Davis at Stanford as a postdoctoral fellow. Davis had been characterizing the T-cell receptor and drawing on comparisons between antibody and T-cell receptor subunits, she and Dr. Davis developed models showing how the T-cell receptor binds to MHC molecules. From this work, she went on in 1989 to join the faculty at the California Institute of Technology and tackled a variety of new enigmas. She discovered the novel mechanism of how a specific protein called FCRN binds to maternal antibodies to transport them first across the placenta and after birth across the intestinal wall to give infants immune protection prior to their exposure to pathogens. For more than a decade, Dr. Bjorkman has also been tackling a problem that has confounded biology since HIV emerged in the 1980s. This virus is notorious for evading the human antibody response. Most of the antibodies produced are sp strain specific, yet HIV mutates within an individual's body, so the relevant immune target is constantly morphing. Dr. Bjorkman noticed that HIV's envelope holds relatively few spike proteins, which is what antibodies target. She proposed how this predicament might underlie part of the feeble antibody response to this virus. Her experimental results supported her idea and pointed toward ways to increase avidity. She and Rockefeller immunologist Michelle Nussenzweig have collaborated for many years to study patient HIV antibodies that do manage to neutralize a broad range of HIV strains. They hope to be able to train the immune system to obliterate the first strain the body encounters and thus circumvent the problem posed by HIV's propensity to mutate. They are co-authors on more than 60 papers and share a close partnership. This and other work well positioned doctors Bjorkman and Nussenzweig to respond swiftly to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Dr. Bjorkman has determined the structures of antibodies made by patients who have recovered from COVID-19 that effectively neutralize the virus. These antibodies bind the extracellular tip of the viral spike protein that interacts with the virus's receptor on human cells. These atomic level details have provided insights into which variants in the virus might escape binding by antibodies and therefore thwart vaccines. Dr. Bjorkman is also developing so-called mosaic nanoparticles that display host cell binding components from SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. This approach presents a method for creating a vaccine that will protect people from multiple related viruses. Dr. Bjorkman's numerous distinctions include membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, election to the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the American Philosophical Society. 
She has received many honors in addition to the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, including the Canada Gairdner International Award, the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science International Award, and the NIH Director's Pioneer Award. And now, Dr. Campbell and I will read the prize citation to Dr. Bjorkman this evening. Dr. Pamela Bjorkman, you are being honored for discovering key aspects of immune system function and for directing these insights toward improved strategies to combat viral scourges and otherwise enhance human health across the globe. With impressive vision and relentless dedication, you applied X-ray crystallography to unveil the mechanism by which human cells present foreign and self molecules to T cells. Your elucidation of key structures and their physical interactions, combined with your functional analysis, has similarly cracked open other perplexing physiological conundrums. By exploring this knowledge, you are harnessing the immune system to limit disease and relieve suffering. You have set the highest standard for the community of scientists by demonstrating how boldness, creativity, and persistence can fuel discoveries with far-reaching impact. Today, in presenting you with the 2021 Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, we recognize and thank you for illuminating crucial features of the immune system and activities performed by immune-like molecules, and for applying your imagination toward developing novel, wide-ranging, and potent vaccines and therapeutics. It is my honor to present to Dr. Pamela Bjorkman the 2021 Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. On behalf of the Distinguished Selection Committee and all of us with you virtually today, we congratulate you on this award. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Dr. Campbell, for your wonderful tributes and to the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize Selection Committee for this honor. I would also like to thank the late Dr. Green Guard and Ursula von Reidingsvard for establishing this prize. Dr. Greengard's research in neuronal signaling epitomizes the type of science that I have always strived to do, that is, investigate a fundamentally interesting scientific question that is also relevant to human health and disease. And I feel that I share a love of 3D structure with Ms. von Reidingsvard. In her case, she makes shapes into art. In the case of my lab, we interpret and also admire shapes of biological molecules. And Dr. Campbell, I am incredibly inspired by your work at Spelman College to fill a much needed talent gap, namely the education and training of young women of color who have become and will continue to be leaders in their fields. I hope you will encourage Spelman students and alumni to consider Caltech for positions at all levels, especially professorial. I would also like to thank my lab, both in its present and previous incarnations, for their dedication, creativity, and brilliance. It has been my pleasure to mentor amazingly talented students and postdocs for over 30 years at Caltech. They've never ceased to surprise me with their ideas for experiments that often lead to us in directions I would not have anticipated. And I want to commend the current lab members for persevering during the difficulties created by COVID-19, not only did they manage to keep experiments going under difficult circumstances, but many of them pivoted to a new direction for us, that is coronaviruses. And finally, I'd like to thank my family, my husband Kai Zinn, also a scientist and professor at Caltech, and our two children, Leif and Katya, for their support and love over the years. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bjorkman. We are thrilled to have been able to honor you and your work with the Green Guard Prize. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to ask you a few questions about your fascinating research. First, I think we all are truly impressed that you took on an exceptionally challenging project as a starting graduate student. What sparked your interest in solving the type 1 MHC structure and what were some of the challenges in this project, even getting uh, agreement from uh, your advisor to take it on? Maybe we could start there. Okay, well, when I came to graduate school, I had not considered structural biology as a possible route of inquiry. And like you said, I 
heard Don Wiley talk about his work with influenza hemagglutinin, and he did not have a structure at the time, but he really portrayed what the structure could tell him. And so then I found out about Jack Strominger's work on MHC molecules, and I started, as a chemistry major, I knew no immunology, but I started reading it, and there was this fascinating structural problem. How does a T cell, which must have a receptor that looks like an antibody, how does it recognize both a viral antigen and an MHC molecule? Because all the viral antigens are gonna look different. So I thought, oh, this is perfect. Don Wiley will have the hemagglutinin structure, and I'll solve the MHC structure, and we'll dock them together, and we'll answer this. So I thought it was a perfect structural biology question to address this. But of course, the answer was not nothing to do with the structure of the intact hemagglutinin, but we learned about that later. So how did you go about uh, trying to solve it and uh, how straightforward? You know, we, we look at the outcome and think, ah, well, okay, the successful project uh, as if it were preordained, but I'm sure that wasn't the case. Uh, it seems like a rather complex structure to have tried to uh, crystallize to begin with. You know, if we had known at the time that MHC molecules, when you purify them, they present a multitude of different peptides that are chemically heterogeneous, no one would have ever tried to crystallize this. Luckily, we did not know because the idea was you need absolutely homogeneous protein. And this was not homogeneous by any means. I don't know why, but it did not crystallize well. These days, you can get crystals of MHC molecules with defined peptides and you can solve their structure in a day. But that was not the case back then. The crystals were very small and they were very thin, which was most of the technical problems. And so this required going to various synchrotrons for high intensity X-ray radiation, which was the only thing that allowed me to get the data I needed to solve the structure. There were a lot of technical, very boring crystallographic um, problems along the way, which are described in my PhD thesis. And, and how about in the analysis? Uh, obviously, a lot of math and physics uh, in the analysis. Did you have a background that suited you well to the solution of this problem uh, when you started, or is this something uh, that you learned on the fly? I learned X-ray crystallography theory, but I had taken a lot of math classes as an undergraduate, and so I was ready to dive into this. And there was a lot of, of theoretical things, but I would say that the the weirdest part of it was finally when I got reasonably reasonable electron density maps. There were various problems with them being extremely noisy and hard to interpret. And there was this weird density in the middle, which of course was the image of the mixture of bound peptides. But I didn't know that at the time, so I thought the maps were wrong. And so there was a, or there, there was some kind of artifact. And so there was like quite a while before we in the Wiley lab figured out, by only by assigning every single amino acid in the extracellular domain of this MHC molecule, were we able to say, okay, there's extra density. It's not part of the protein. And did the solution when it uh, ultimately came together, uh, was that a surprise or did you think, ah, well, yeah, this was pretty much what we expected to find all along? It was not what I expected to find. It was definitely not what I expected to find. There, there were just, it was really fun to analyze this because there, there was more than a decade worth of research from immunology labs mapping the polymorphic residues on all these sequences of class one MHC molecules. And then we find this groove at the top that's occupied by a peptide and all the polymorphic residues point towards the peptide, either from the sides or from the bottom. And it just, all of a sudden it made sense. But for some reason, none of this had ever occurred to me. And I don't think it had occurred to anyone else because certainly no one was talking about MHC molecules always being occupied with peptide. And no one had ever said, oh, I'll bet these polymorphic residues are going to be hidden, in fact, except recognized by the peptide. So it was a big surprise to me, but then it made complete sense and we were so lucky that we had, like I said, over a decade of research into this that we looked at the structure and it just went, oh, I get it now. 
So, so it was exactly the right time. Had it not been technically challenging to solve that structure, it would have come out prior to a lot of this research and it would have, I think, been uninterpretable. Well, that's an am amazing story. Throughout your career, you've applied structural biology techniques to explore a variety of physio physiological phenomena. So how and why do you think uh, structural approaches are so powerful and why do they provide insights that other methodologies can't? I think they provide insights in within the context of interpretations from other technologies. So what I like to do is get a structure and then interpret it with reference to either our experiments that are suggested by the structure or the experiments in the literature. I feel like I don't, I personally don't understand anything until I see it in three dimensions. And that's not always necessary for making fundamental discoveries, but that's just the way I think about it. So once I see the structure, we can then design experiments or interpret experiments from the literature. Your work is a beautiful example of that uh, because uh, your work built upon another Perlmeister Green Guard uh, Award winner's uh, work, uh, Pip Americ, who had shown uh, uh, that uh, this, this had to be a single molecule, the T-cell receptor had to be a single molecule that was recognizing both MHC and antigen. Yes, that was like my favorite paper ever. The, the paper that you're referring to from Pippa, Pippa Merrick, and I breathed a great sigh of relief because the structure in, was a way to interpret that. Yeah, it was truly beautiful. So you then switched to work on HIV. Why was your insight about the relative baldness of HIV particles important for understanding the weak antibody responses to this virus? Uh, and, uh, and, and how did you come to work on HIV to begin with? Uh, okay, well, so I think it was around 2005 or 2006, David Baltimore, who was then the president of Caltech, he started, he wanted to do what he called engineer immunity against HIV, which means a gene therapy method to deliver antibodies. And at the time, there were very few broadly neutralizing antibodies, and so, he was talking about this and I thought, wow, if you deliver them genetically, you could modify them and then you could make them better. So I thought, we know about antibodies, we know about protein design, we can make them better. So of course, it was a lot more complicated than that. It's very hard to make them better, but let me just say that I thought that a way to make them better would be to allow them to utilize, to better utilize avidity effects, that is simultaneous binding of their antigen binding fragments. So we started thinking about that. And so the, to cut a long story short, I began teaching freshman biology at Caltech for non-majors, which is called Bi-1. So it's a required course in the core curriculum. I taught this and I framed it on HIV because I wanted to learn about HIV myself. And I started looking at all the electron micrographs which were available at the time versus the schematics of HIV. And the schematics showed lots of HIV spikes, lots of them. And the electron micrographs did not. And so I started thinking there's something wrong here. If this particle, if this virion really has so few spikes, there is no way for antibodies to use both of their arms to simultaneously bind to the virion surface. And then if the spike mutates, which it does in HIV, then they're not gonna have avidity effects to counteract the mutation so that you know they could bind with one arm or the other, and they're just gonna fall off and be useless. So we started thinking about that and reviewed the literature and published something in 2010. This was Josh Klein, a former graduate student in my lab. And so we thought about this in theory, and it has now guided a lot of the research in my lab. Beautiful. So where are you going with this project now, and how, how are you going to be able to address this uh, challenge? Well, every time I think we've figured it out, HIV outsmarts us. Uh, it's a beautifully evolved virus, unfortunately, for humans. We have made 
compounds that we think might be able to bind simultaneously to a single HIV spike trimer. They aren't practical to make, however, and so we don't think they could be used therapeutically. We are continuing to try and figure out so, so there are no avidity effects if the spikes are too far apart. You can't reach between spikes with your arms if the spikes are too far apart. So you, there's no avidity effects. But what if you had a spike trimer and it has three identical places where the antibody fabs could bind and you could get two of them bound at once? HIV won't allow that. The spike has apparently, in my opinion, evolved, at least I believe it evolved, to avoid that, to avoid avidity effects. So we're trying very hard to make something that could bind simultaneously with avidity to spike trimers. That has proven to be a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Be interested in hearing you talk about uh, the general understanding of how viruses hide immunologically important regions of their surface proteins and how you're trying to uh, outsmart them. Well, it's interesting because HIV is a master at this because it stays in someone's body lifelong. And so it has to evade the immune system and it's covered in and linked carbohydrates to mask protein epitopes. It hides other conserved regions. It, the spike trimer does not allow for every broadly neutralizing antibody we've ever looked at. You cannot bind two fabs of a bivalent IgG simultaneously. It's just the shape of it won't allow that. It has gone to massive amounts of evolutionary pressure, I assume, to evolve the low density of spike trimers and also just the shape that doesn't allow bivalent binding of a single IgG. Now you look at SARS-CoV-2 and it just puts its epitopes out there because Coronaviruses are sort of, you go in, infect, and then it goes out. It's not a lifelong infection. And so there's less of a evolutionary pressure for those types of viruses to evolve all these fancy escape mechanisms. And yet here we are with uh, SARS-CoV-2 now, and uh, these viruses are evolving to escape uh, the immune response. I'd be interested in uh, hearing you talk a little bit about uh, some of your recent research on viral escape mutants and how those relate to uh, evolutionary pressure, not just uh, to evade uh, the immune response, uh, but to optimize their binding to their re cellular receptors. Yeah, I, I think in, it's the variants of concern for SARS-CoV-2 are, of course, very concerning. I think the world kind of gave this virus a massive playground in which to infect and then mutate. And probably there's some thought that the variants of concern arise in immunocompromised infected people who keep the virus for longer before it's cleared, but then they go on and infect others. I do have a prop here for showing you the SARS-CoV-2, structure of the SARS-CoV-2 trimer. And I want to point out a couple of things about it. First of all, these pink and purple things are the variable regions of an antibody. It's one of Michelle Nussenswag's lab's antibodies, isolated by Davide Robiani from COVID-19 infected individual. And this is a structure that Christopher Barnes in my lab did by cryo-electron microscopy. But I want to point out the gray parts. These are the receptor binding domains, and they bind to the host receptor, ACE2, uh, that lines your lung epithelial cells. And those are just sticking out there, ready for antibodies to bind. And so they're not hiding these. I also want to point out that um, if you take two of these, from modeling of all the structures we and others have done so far, and I think we've done like maybe 30 structures of Michelle's antibodies and other labs' antibodies, a lot of them you can bind bivalently with a single IgG. So you could come, the rest of the IgG would be out here. So you could bind with avidity to a single spike. You could probably also cross-link between neighboring spikes. 
But I just want to point out that these receptor binding domains are way out there. You get really strong neutralizing antibodies to these. And so Michelle has, and others have been characterizing these. Um, I did want to point out, though, that uh, the receptor binding domains can be either up or down, and these antibodies come off. And so what you're seeing are two, these two RBDs are up, this RBD is down, and you can only get binding to the receptor, the ACE2 receptor, if they're up. And so part of the fun of doing the structures are seeing if the, if the receptor binding domains are up versus down. They, uh, like I said, I think they can only bind to the receptor, to the ACE2 receptor if they're up. But I want to point out that um, the variants of concern are all up here, the mutations up here, up here. They're not down here in this part that's sort of hidden. That is remaining constant. And it's fairly constant among different uh, Sar Sarbico viruses, which are SARS like beta coronaviruses. So that part is one of, you know, they're, they're, is sort of hiding the more conserved regions. So that harkens back to HIV a little bit in that sense. But it's certainly a lot easier for your immune system to make very powerful neutralizing antibodies against coronaviruses. But, you know, SARS-CoV-2, now that it's been in so many people, is making mutations up here. And we can just look on our structures and predict which antibodies will be affected by those mutations. You can then do experiments, and it will verify if the antibody binds in that site, it's likely to be affected. So this poses the question of uh, now that uh, monoclonal antibodies are uh, increasingly being used uh, to uh, treat people who, uh, who are early in infection or to prevent uh, disease, uh, some of the uh, viruses that are circulating in the population have mutations that prevent uh, the antibody binding that you uh, just described. Uh, do you think you can now, knowing the structures, effectively model the, uh, uh, what might be a, an antibody that would restore binding of these antibodies? Yes, yes. And in fact, we've got, um, there's, there are antibodies known that have been published from Veer, the company, and I think one other paper, and also our lab in collaboration with Michelle's lab, it binds to this place down here. I can't even point to it. It's a little bit obscured. And so that, those are not sensitive whatsoever to changes in the variants of concern. And people make those antibodies because the, the two we characterized came from a COVID-19 patient who had recovered. It's just that they don't make that many of them. So our vaccine effort in my lab is specifically geared towards trying to raise those antibodies, not these. These are extremely powerful and very well neutralizing, but you can get escape from them in, a, uh, in the variants of concern. Now, fortunately, the vaccine induces a polyclonal response. So does COVID-19 infection. So does, so does SARS-CoV-2 infection, a polyclonal response. So you're likely, even the variants of concern won't wipe out your complete response. And there's also T cell responses as well, which we haven't gotten into. But I really think we must have, be prepared for the next infection, the next crossover infection from animals into humans of a coronavirus. And I think the best bet is to raise antibodies specifically against these regions, which are sort of hidden and are less easy to make. And those should not be affected by the mutations in the variants of concern. And also, they're conserved among Sarbico viruses that might potentially cross over into humans in, in a new epidemic or pandemic. So because these sites are so highly conserved uh, uh, across the evolution of these viruses, uh, you believe that uh, there's an opportunity to make a pan-coronavirus uh, family vaccine then? Well, I pan sarbicovirus vaccine, because that means SARS-like beta coronavirus, 
We, we cannot yet do it for alpha coronaviruses, although we could make a pan-alpha coronavirus vaccine, but so far we've made the um, prototype and it's been tested in animals so far. It makes neutralizing antibodies that we want that cross-react between Sarvico viruses. So that's what we're trying to push forward. It's fascinating. So you're also working on mosaic nanoparticle vaccines against coronaviruses. Where did that idea come from and uh, what are their theoretical and actual uh, abilities? Their design, I understand, depends in part on deploying these conserved regions. And uh, uh, do you think that this is a path that uh, will lead to success with uh, these uh, viruses that haven't yet uh, emerged? Well, that's what I was referring to in trying to raise the antibodies against this region. So what we did, and we being led by Alex Cohen, who was then a graduate student, um, is he made a mosaic nanoparticle. So we have a platform that's like plug and display that was developed by Mark Howorth at Oxford University. So basically we just, we expressed a lot of different RBDs, receptor binding domains, which are just the gray domain here. We express those with a small tag on them, and then we can covalently bind them to a nanoparticle, which has something called spy catcher, and then the tag is 13 residues, it's called spy tag. So we just mix these, they bind covalently. So there are 60 sites on the nanoparticle to which we can bind RBDs. So we made a number of different mosaic nanoparticles where we just mix different RBDs. So why did we do that? Well, this comes back to considerations about avidity effects. And so hopefully I can explain this without the diagram I usually use, but let's say you're a B cell receptor, which is a membrane bound antibody and you have two arms right here. If you are being activated by an antigen, you are likely to bind to, if you have a so-called homotypic particle where every RBD is the same, you'll bind to distracting epitopes, which we would consider the ones that vary up here to be those distracting epitopes. Like they're, they're just out there and they're ready to bind and you make all these antibodies against them. So that's what you would activate. But we want to activate a part that's a little bit less accessible. And so if we have neighboring RBDs, no two neighbors are the same, then their distracting epitopes will be different. But what will be in common are the conserved regions. And now you'll activate B cell receptors that make antibodies against those conserved regions through avidity effects. That's the theory anyway. And so that's why we made the mosaic nanoparticles. We then tested the approach in mice. We're now testing them in non-human primates. And what we get are, we get better cross-reactive responses to different Sarbico viruses if we use the mosaic particles compared to the homotypic particles, although both work very well in terms of these neutralizing uh, responses. But I think that in the long run, this technology should be relatively easy to implement. It would work right now as a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 and the variants of concern. And then I think it could work, based on the data we have so far, against emerging Sarbico viruses that spill over from from bats and other animals. So of course we don't know what those viruses are going to be. So we have surrogates of those viruses where we do not include them on the mosaic nanoparticle. We don't include an RBD from a certain virus and then we say, do we see an immune response to that, to that virus? And the answer so far has been yes. So we think that that's kind of predictive of what might happen if that particular virus happened to emerge. Fascinating. So in 2010, Working Mother magazine named you one of its most powerful moms in STEM. Rather than asking standard questions about advice for young female scientists who want to have families, perhaps uh, a more relevant question uh, that you might not have been asked before is, uh, uh, from a different angle, what advice do you have for the partners of uh, scientist moms? I think my most important advice would be that as the partner of a 
woman who's a scientist who's had a baby, if it's your baby and you're married to that person, it's important to realize that there's a lot of so-called emotional uh, baggage or something, or emotional work that goes along with being the parent of a child. Like when they get older, well, first there's daycare considerations and arrangements, and then there's doctor's appointments in their school, and, this, and it goes on and on and on. And this often falls to women. I talk to women all the time, and they're the ones who do this. And it adds up to the point of being really difficult. So I would say, please invest in that as well. And make sure that the mother of your children is not the person who is completely and utterly responsible for doing that. Uh, the next thing I would say is that in my generation anyway, I don't know if it's still the same for uh, women having babies these days. My children are 27 and 32 now. But when I was first a mother, I was struck by the fact that within my generation, having children, no matter how much I did for my children, it was going to be less than what my mother did for her children. And no matter how much my husband did for our children, it was going to be more than his father did. So men in general, at least in my generation, would feel great about their kids and what was going on. And women would not necessarily feel great. And I thought about that constantly. And I think there might be a little, maybe people could sort of appreciate that and think about it. It sounds like another system that's uh, going to continue to evolve. At least we can hope. Thank you. So, once again, Pamela, all of us here at Rockefeller would like to extend our warmest congratulations uh, to you on being the recipient of the 2021 Perlmeister Green Guard Prize. A special thank you as well to Mary Schmidt Campbell for being part of this celebration today. To everyone in our virtual community, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you all in person at a future event. Until then, I hope you and your families stay safe and well. Have a terrific evening.